Thank you for joining me today for this Bible study. The title of the lesson today is simply Citizen. We are citizens of two kingdoms, of this world and of the kingdom of God. Someone said to D.L. Moody one time, Mr. Moody, which kingdom is most important? Moody said, I'm a part of the kingdom of God, but I vote in Cook County, Illinois. Well, that's about where I am. I, I love being a part of the kingdom of God, but I vote in Duval County. Citizenship is usually seen in terms of authority and relationship to that authority. Now, there are times when we do not appreciate authority as much as we do at other times. Sometimes it seems like government is into our business too much. At other times, we don't see how we would make it if government was, were not in our business. And so as a result of government being in our business, that we understand true citizenship. Our scripture comes from the 13th chapter of the book of Romans. Let me read some verses. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, the powers that are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinances of God, and that they resist, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil works. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, thou shalt have the same praise. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that does evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject not only to wrath, but for conscience sake. This idea of authority and how we respond to it, it all has to be put in context. Sometimes we don't respond correctly. I shared with my Tuesday Bible class some time ago about an experience I had in Louisiana when I was pastor of Broadmoor Baptist Church. I had been down south Louisiana doing a retreat for an association. It had been just a magnificent experience. So many good things happened out of that retreat. Well, on the way back, I was thinking about everything good that had happened and everything good that was going to happen on the Sunday that I got back as pastor of my church. And I kept considering these things and honestly, rather unintentionally, but not all the way, I was speeding and a policeman pulled me over. And when he pulled me over, I pulled out my driver's license. He said, I recognize you. He says, you're Dr. John Sullivan. You're Pastor Broadmoor Baptist Church. I watch you on television just about every Sunday. I said to him, well, thank you so very much. That, means a lot to me to know that people are watching. I really was hoping he would say, I'm not going to give you a ticket. But he kept writing all the time he was saying, I, I love to hear you preach. I love your program on television. And all the time he kept writing. I wondered, why is he writing so much? I thought he was going to let me out of this ticket now that he knows who I am. And when he finished writing, he handed me the ticket and said, Dr. Sullivan, keep up the good work. Now, I knew I was wrong. 
I knew I was speeding. But I somehow hoped that he would overlook my infraction of the law. He didn't. Kind of taught me a lesson also. It's not who knows you that's going to make the difference when you come to citizenship. It's what you understand about your relationship to authority. Well, here we are in this pandemic crisis. Nobody ever dreamed we'd be here. No one. No one ever dreamed that the economy of the United States of America would essentially be shut down and put multiplied millions of people out of work because of a virus. No one dreamed the number of deaths that would happen as a result and the number of cases, the field hospitals, the transforming of gymnasiums into hospitals, all that went on. No one dreamed. It was absolutely surreal. I watched it. I just, every morning I would wake up saying, nope, we're still there. We're still in the pandemic. But I'm telling you, had it not been for the authority of government during the pandemic, only God in all of His wisdom knows how many more deaths, how many more cases would have taken place. So I'm grateful for authority that steps in. Now I'm also grateful when that authority starts stepping out. I do not want government ruling my life, but I do want to respect the authority of government. I want to be a good citizen. That's what Paul's talking about. Being a good citizen, doing the right things at the right time. I came across a note by Wilbur Smith, Dr. Wilbur Smith. Deep Roots of lawlessness, lawlessness, Four Concepts of Lawlessness in Scripture. The first one, he says, is the lawlessness of revelings, R-E-V-E-L-L-I-N-G-S. Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21. This idea of revelings has the background of people would go to a party and they would all get crocked. They'd get smashed, and then they'd go out on the streets and see how many people they could insult. That was the revelings. No, no respect at all for the life of others. No respect at all for dignity. No respect for the law. Just lawless. That, that's revelings as one kind of lawless. Number two, hatred and enmity. This is between classes of people. This is between races. This is between the haves and the have-nots. If we're not careful, we will build into our systems and we will build into our own personal life some unhealthy things that lean toward lawlessness. When we know what's happening in our life when we know the social, educational, and other things that we might make a part of our prejudice. You know, it bothers me when people talk about the uneducated folks. Listen, my dad was uneducated, but he could fix anything. I have multiple degrees and I can fix nothing. So it all has to be held in balance. It all has to be held with an understanding that this 
is not a put down of anyone. We cannot afford the luxury. And our next lesson is on acceptance. That we cannot afford the luxury of lawlessness at the point of our own prejudice. It happened way too long in this nation. And I'm not going to get in. This is not a study in civics. This is not a study in prejudice. But we just need to understand that hatred, I don't understand how some people can have such hatred, such bitterness in their life for another person. The third thing Wilbur Smith says is that there is an abandonment, an abandonment, an abandonment of all dignity and of all authority. It came to my mind the story of the prodigal son. This is an abandonment. He abandoned. He abandoned everything he had ever known. He abandoned his family. He abandoned his culture. He abandoned his religious life. What he had been taught, he abandoned. You remember the story. There were two boys, the younger and the older. And the younger boy said, Father, I want everything that's coming to me. I want to go live it up. And his father gave it to him. And it says in the scripture, he went into the far country and there he spent his money, his livelihood on riotous living. He blew it. He blew his inheritance. One morning he woke up and realized, I don't have any more money. And he looked around and said, now I don't have any friends. He spent his money in riotous living. He abandoned everything about him. And then it's the New International Version that has the best translation. It says, and he came to himself. He woke up, came to the understanding that I need something in my life that I've abandoned. I will arise, I will go to my father, I will say to him, I've sinned, make me a servant. You know the rest of the story. But this idea of lawlessness, abandonment of everything we know and of everything we've been taught. And then lawlessness, just having contempt for the law. The breakdown. Pornography is one of the big examples. It's the mirage of sexuality. Pornography. When we know that and understand that, I don't understand how we let it, let it move us into a certain place that we have no respect for what's going on. No respect for the dignity of life. No respect for the dignity of womanhood primarily. There's no respect. Lawless. Lawless in what we're doing. I could go on and talk about organized crime and the law, uh, lawlessness of organized crime. Let me go on with the lesson. This idea that we owe no man. Let me pick up in verse 8. Well, let me pick up in verse 7. Render therefore... To all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, it is brief. Briefly comprehended in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So it is this law of love, a larger debt we have to pay beyond our taxes, 
beyond our respect for the law, there is the love that we must show toward others as a child of God. Now, I could tell you that there's three words for love in Greek. You already know that. It's the agape kind of love that I want to talk about. Love that can overcome the obstacles. The kind of love that Jesus has had for us. Overcoming the obstacles of life. And in this what Jesus has done for us, this matter of love. Listen to it. You know that one of the greatest passages in all of the Bible is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn to there. If you would, chapter 13, just a few pages over, and you'll find Paul's comments on love. Chapter 13. He says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I speak two languages, human and spiritual. Though I speak with the words of man and angels, men and angels, and have not love, I'm a clinking sound. I just click and clang. I don't make any sense. Listen to it. I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. No matter how much I can speak, if I don't have love. Then he goes on to say, though I have the gift of prophecy, though I can understand all mystery, and I can understand all things, though I have faith so that I could remove mountains, and have not love, I am Nothing. Oh, what an inclusive statement. How you could have such animosity. I'm talking about a child of God. I'm not talking about those who are outside the purview of grace. I'm talking about those who claim to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of life. If I don't love as he loved me, I'm nothing. Though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Now, what kind of love is he talking about? Love is very patient and kind, never jealous or envious, never boast nor proud, never haughty nor selfish nor rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. It is never glad about injustice but rejoices whenever truth wins out. When you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You will always believe in him, always expect the best of him, and always stand your ground in defending him. And, when you do this, love never fails. This is the kind of love that Jesus has had for us, an unfailing love. Never haughty, nor selfish, nor rude. Does not demand its own way. Does not demand its own way. Oh, listen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, if we want to look like Jesus, we have to love. And we have to do it unconditionally. Do you mean that we should overlook everything that comes down the pipe? No, I'm not talking about that. 
I'm talking about adversity. We need to love as the people of God. Now this love as the people of God, we must know that this love is real. And because it is real, there are certain things about it, certain things that love it talks about adultery, murder, theft, covetousness. These are all the opposite things of love that he's talking about. Now you have relationships in life. All of us have relationships in life. And those relationships should lead us to love one another. I have a relationship there are three basic relationships. For you note takers, there are three basic relationships in life. I have a relationship to God. I have a relationship to others. I have a relationship to myself. Those are the three basic relationships of life. My relationship to God is either a saved or a lost relationship. I either know Him through Jesus Christ or I do not know Him through Jesus Christ. I have a relationship. And even, even as a saved person, I have a relationship to the unsaved person that's called my witness. And so when we know and understand what we need to do and become in that relationship to God, though I can speak God language if I do not love, I do not have a proper relationship to God and I do not have a proper relationship to my neighbor. Those are the vertical, the horizontal relationships. Vertical, I relate to God. Horizontal, I relate to man. And as this one gets tilted, so does this one. So when we are loving one another, we love God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our being. And then we have a relationship to others. Now, if I had a whiteboard, I would illustrate what I mean. Uh, this starts at the very beginning and works its way out. My basic relationship to others is my, my relationship first to my wife. My first responsibility relationally in life is to my wife. It's not to my children. It's to my wife. That's the basic relationship I have and have had now for nearly 65 years. And this relationship to the wife is a growing relationship. Still, after 65 years. Then there's the relationship to your children. Those are the next intimate others of your life. Your children, their spouses. You do realize that when you marry and your children get married, you also marry the spouse and her family. You cannot ignore them. Our in-laws, for us, they're very precious. They've been good for our children. We're very grateful for that. Good for our grandchildren. We're very grateful for that. So there is the relationship to my wife, then to my family, then to the intimate others of my life, my church friends, my church family. I have a relationship to the church. That relationship is one of love. And then it goes on out from that to friendship. There are certain folks within the family that you like better than other folks and you build a friendship with those folks. And then beyond that, acquaintance. Just folks who know me and folks I know. But the only relationship I have with them is that I know them. When Billy Graham died, someone asked me, did you know Billy Graham? I said, no. I met him twice. I stood in line two times to meet him. One was when I was a student at seminary and he came to preach in seminary chapel. 
I missed half of my next class because I stood in line to shake hands with Billy Graham and to tell him my name and to thank him for what he was doing. I stood in line to do that. My second time was at a Southern Baptist convention where I was the parliamentarian and Dr. Graham was going to come to speak to the convention. I reminded him of Southwestern Seminary days and he seemed to remember the occasion. Not me, but he seemed to remember the occasion. So the best I could say, I'm not even acquainted with Billy Graham, but because of his notoriety in Baptist ranks, he's part of this whole circle of relationships. Now, when we know and understand that love is so important in the citizenship that we exhibit, that we love one another. The world is not going to listen to us until it sees our ministry of love. We must learn to love one another. Doesn't mean I can't discuss my disapproval. But we have to do it in love. Sometimes that's easier said than done. But it must be said and done. So Paul wants us to know that love Hits the mark every time you love. I love Jesus Christ. I love what he's done in my life. I love what he's done in my family. I love Jesus Christ. I trust you do today. And when we love Christ as we ought, citizenship becomes a reality in terms of authority. I trust that you're loving one another. I trust that life is so valuable you're not going to waste it on hatred and lawlessness. Let me pray with you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that leaders of government should not be a terror to our lives. We should see them as doing good and not evil. Now, Lord, I know there are exceptions, and sometimes we just get sorry leaders. I understand that, that there are exceptions. But the rule is to love those in authority, for they seek to do you good and not evil. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.